I'm glad you put up with me. I hope you put up with me. 286. You had a good day? What about the cool the cool wave? And, no, not yet. What about old Lawrence McClure? Oh, that was a, tremendous. For those of you that uh, aren't Lawrence fans, too bad. <laughs> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I don't want to hurt your feelings now. Turn to page 286. Do you love the Lord? Say amen. Amen. Happy, happy today. All right, Kimmy. Sing it pretty now. Praise report, given at this time, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. You know, Dixie had surgery today. <laughs> Yesterday. And, uh, she had trouble with her heart, and but they thought about a pacemaker, but she can, uh, Rua said, with medication, and so that'll be good. Terry Duncan uh, had um, uh, an eye problem. You know, he had glaucoma really, really bad, and so they had to drill the hole. You know, it's not fun, but that's what they did. And so he had that yesterday, he went back today. And the pressure went down from high to, to right. And so Amen. he's thanking God for that. He's got to go back again tomorrow uh, from West Virginia to, to University, Ohio State University. So All right. pray for them. It's so member Maryland to Maryland. Uh, Brueggemann had surgery and went home, uh, but she's, she's having some complications as well. Bless her, so sweetheart. let's remember Maryland in prayer. Sister Ola, good to see you. Good to see Ron here. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He's been in the hospital. I'm telling Amen. you, we've had, we've had a, a season. Amen. Yes. Amen. 
just remember that request. Any others? Yes. All right. Amen. Amen. Yes. All right. All right. Any others? Yes. All right, let's remember him in prayer. Any others? Yes. He's at Chris's, but he's not doing too well. So Henry said he didn't look good, but he was out today. So pray for him. They'll be home, I think, pretty soon. All right. Let's remember Raj. Any others? Yes. Bless you, bud. Yes. Let's remember that. Yes, Sergeant. Pass out that from Goodwood. We are still praying here and saying thanks for the playing of the first morning of our house today. Amen. Amen. Any others? Yes. Yes, remember Val in prayer, sure enough. Any others? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes. Remember that. Any others? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's remember that. Any others? Right 
Any others? <laughs> Good. Serves you right. <laughs> Shame on you. Democrats sit in the back of the area. So if you could just, you could just <laughs> on the left side of the audience. So. You're on the wrong side. <laughs> All right, any others? <laughs> Amen. Yes. yes. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> any others? <laughs> You don't get this everywhere. You sure you don't. don't. <laughs> you sure don't. <laughs> it's becoming a weekly thing with me and you. I don't know about this. <laughs> no. Lord, help us. <laughs> Amen. You did. You did. All right, let's get back to church. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> any, other, <laughs> any other requests? <laughs> Any unspoken requests, you'll raise your hand, all the world gather around the altar. Oh, sing with us. Sing. Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. That calls me from a word of care. And bids me at my father's throne.
for tonight's offering. Goes to a Good Samaritan Fund. Sonny does a great job with that. So anything that you give tonight goes to help support our Good Samaritan Fund. Brother Roos, would you pray for us? James chapter 5, James chapter 5, James chapter 5, these are the, the closing words from the pen of James, the half-brother of our Lord. We'll be looking in verses number 19 and 20, but I think you'll agree with me, James is, is the most, probably, I think, practical book in all the Bible. Uh, this, this brother of our Lord who saw the Lord Jesus live out his life before him has given to us in the pages of this book a message about daily, down-to-earth, practical Christian living. Someone said, while well, the Apostle Paul writes about the believing side of faith, old James writes about the behaving side of faith. So we raise the question, what will be the closing words of James? What will be his final words that he wants to leave on our hearts? Uh, he has left us with some tremendous matters. Uh, he has talked about some great things. If you remember, he started it right off in chapter 1 telling us, count it all joy you. when you fall into various trials and testings. He said every good and perfect gift is from above. Yeah. He tells us be a doers of the word and not hearers only. Mm -hmm. Then he said faith without works is dead. And he reminded us that our life is like a vapor. Last week, in the last couple weeks, he told us, if any of you are afflicted, you need to pray. If any of you are, are merry, sing songs. And if any of you are sick, we can call for the elders of the church and be anointed with oil. And then he tells us we need to confess our faults one to another. So, so what will be the final subject tonight of James? Last week he talked to us about the healing of the body, and tonight he will close talking to us about the healing of the soul. 
Uh, it, it, it's wonderful when God does a miracle in the body. I think we'd all agree with that. It's a wonderful thing when God touches somebody's body. But you know, it's even more wonderful when God does a miracle in the human soul. And sometimes we get so caught up in the, the material and the physical that we fail to realize the, the primary matters that God deals with us in our lives are spiritual matters. And so these are the things, these spiritual things are the things that ultimately count. Uh, these old bodies are going to waste away and die, but our soul is eternal. And so James lays upon our hearts tonight the responsibility given to every single believer which is to be concerned about the spiritual condition of all people. You know, in the Old Testament, the question was asked, am I my brother's keeper? You get over into James, and James says a resounding, yes, you are your brother's keeper. The Bible clearly teaches that we have the responsibility to other people. And so that's the subject tonight in these final two verses. If there was one theme in these final two verses, it would be the word conversion. If you look at the end of verse 19, James says, and one convert him. And again in verse 20, he that converteth the sinner. Now notice that word convert. Here it means to turn someone around or turn them back again. Now we find the word conversion used in two different ways in the New Testament. Don't miss this part. Sometimes the word is used to refer to the conversion of unsaved people. Turning people from their sin over to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Acts 3.19 Repent ye therefore and be, here's the word, converted that your sins may be blotted out. But then the word is also used in connection with turning Christian people back towards the Lord again who have wandered away previously. Do you remember what Jesus said to old Simon Peter the night before Jesus was crucified? He knew Peter was going to deny him. And in Luke 22, verse 31, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that thy faith faileth not. And then he says this, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. And we look at that and we say, what? Was Peter not converted? Was Peter not saved? No. Simon Peter was a saved person. The word converted means to bring back. Peter had wandered from the Lord. And Jesus already knew he was going to roam and backslide. You do understand it is possible for God's children to wander away from the Lord. To backslide. A condition where you are not as close as you once were. Not in communion or fellowship with the Lord as you once were. Sometimes uh, we would refer to being out of the will of God. It has to be probably, I would say, the most miserable life a Christian can live. Knowing deep down inside you're out of God's will. So James is going to close out his letter tonight by telling us, what we as believers are to do when this happens. There are two things we must do as believers, and James gives them to us one right after the other. Let me give them to you. We'll be finished. First of all, James tells us as believers, we are to be in the business of, number one, restoring yeah. saints. You look in verse 19, James says, Brethren, if any of you... Now, that word brethren, is he talking to saved or unsaved people there? James is talking to saved people. Now watch what he tells them. Brethren, if any of you, those who are saved, do err from the truth. You mark in your Bible, mark that word err. That word means to wander. It means to go astray. It's the picture of sheep getting away from the sheep fold. Peter uses this same terminology in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. He says, for ye were as sheep going astray, but now... You have returned unto the shepherd. Many times in the New Testament, we are compared to sheep. Amen. And I want you to know that's not a compliment. <laughs> sheep are stupid. <laughs> and we know that sheep tend to wander from the shepherd. Uh, in fact, sometimes that is the tendency of sheep. Sheep don't mean to wander away. They don't have the intention of going astray. 
that normally it's just a gradual process. Here's a, a sheep, and this sheep moves over a little further and nibble, nibbles on some grass over here, but then he looks down and he sees a little bit of greener pastures, and they move a little bit further away down there. Then they see some more, and they move a little bit further, and if the shepherd is not there to rein them in, the next thing the sheep knows, it has wandered from the fold. The Bible teaches that is the tendency of God's people, to wander to stray to Rome. There was a wonderful hymn written in the early 1700s. Some of you know it's called Come Thou Founts of Every Blessing. The writer says this, Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Now the writer of that was a man by the name of Robert Robinson. He went one night in his early 20s and got drunk with his best friend. They decided to go to a fortune teller and, and perform a, a, a seance. And he said in his own words, as I was in there with that evil woman, something told me, get out of here now and go down to the street. He got up, he and his friend, he said, we were drunk, went down the street, saw this tent, thought it was a circus. They went in. It was a revival taking place. And George Whitfield was preaching it. And he said, I sat there and it was just as if George Whitfield was preaching at me. And he said, even in my drunken con uh, my condition, I was convicted of my sin, went forward and gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Two months later, he wrote this song. Come thou fount of every blessing. But he said, as I grew older, I lost the happy communion I once had with my Savior. And he said, in my declining years, I, I wandered into deep, deep sin. And as a result, he said, I became deeply troubled in spirit. Hoping to relieve my mind, he said, I decided to travel. And in the course of my journey, I became acquainted with a, a young woman and we began talking on spiritual matters. He said, one day in one of our discussions, she asked me what I thought of a particular hymn she had been reading. Guess which one it was. <laughs> to his astonishment, he found out to be none other than his own. He tried to evade her question, but she continued to press him for a response. And he said, suddenly I just began to weep. Tears streaming down his face. He said, I'm the man who wrote that hymn many years ago. And he said this, I'd give anything to experience the joy I knew back then. She said, well, why can't you? And she read his verse, which says, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune by heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. And this woman, he said, with my own song, began to reassure me that the streams of mercy mentioned were even flowing right then and there. He said, I was deeply touched, and I turned my wandering heart back to the Lord that day, and I was restored to full fellowship with my Savior. But I want you to know, the same process happens to Christians today. Prone to wander. Prone to leave the God I love. It's not something that's automatic. It's not something that's instant. It is a gradual, step-by-step -step thing. A very subtle thing to, to wander away from the Lord. You can hardly detect it. And it could happen in a number of ways. It may begin when we neglect our time with God in His Word. Do we get in God's Word like we once did? Do we spend time with the Lord in prayer like we once did? Do we go to church like we once did? Are we faithful in many of other things? It could be anything, but just a little here and a little there. Before you know it, you wake up one day and you're away from the Lord. People are on rolls of churches across this nation that haven't been to their home church in months or even years. Where are they? Why don't we see them anymore? 
Why aren't they involved? They, they've truly been saved, and yet they don't go anywhere to church anymore. Amen. They've wandered away, and they can blame this or they can blame that, but if they're out of church, the real problem is they're simply wandering from the Lord. Amen. And they're living a life that's below the standard of behavior of a child of God. And this is a frightening possibility. It is the possibility that born-again children of God can wander from the Lord. But James tells us there is something we can do. I want you to notice our responsibility. Here it is. Look at verse 19. He says this. Brethren, and here we are, brothers, sisters in Christ, if any of you err, wander from the truth, and one convert him. Here's the responsibility. It's the responsibility that you and I have to try to turn around some Christian who has wandered away from the Lord. If any of you convert. Remember that word convert means to bring back, to cause a return. What we want to do, we want to have the opportunity to bring some of those who've wandered spiritually away from the Lord to come back. How do we go about it? How do we restore them? I thought, do you remember when uh, old Simon Peter, he did betray Christ three times. Uh, a little girl saw him, right, and called him out. You're one of them. He said, no, I'm not. Another one said, your speech betrays you. You're one of him. What are you? He cursed third time he, he said I don't know him and the, the, the rooster crowed but you know what the Bible says the Bible says at that moment on that third time we don't know how it was he was located or what but he saw Jesus and the Bible says at that moment at that third denial Jesus Christ turned and looked at him can you imagine now do you think that look was a a con condemning look, a look that said, you, you low-down, rotten scoundrel, how could you? Do you think that's what it was? I don't think so. I think it was a loving, a hurtful look that, that he had towards him. Uh, Professor Howard Hendricks of Dallas Seminary tells a story of a young man who, who, after straying far from the Lord, was finally brought back by the help of a friend who loved him unconditionally. When he was fully restored, Dr. Hendricks asked him what it felt like when he was straying from God. The man answered. He said, it seemed like I was being pulled farther and farther out to sea into deep water. Yeah. And all my friends were standing on the shoreline hurling accusations at me about justice, condemnation, and sin. Then he added, but there was one Christian brother who actually swam out to get me. And he wouldn't let me go. I fought him, but he withstood my fighting. He grasped me, put a life jacket around me, and managed to pull me back to shore. And by the grace of God, he was the single reason I was restored, simply because the man refused to let me go. When we wander away from the Lord, it doesn't cause the Lord to stop loving us, does it? It shouldn't cause us to stop loving them either. So we need to love people back to Jesus. God's given us this ministry of restoration. That's the first ministry we have given to us in this verse by old James. We are to restore the saints. But then there's another ministry, a second one, a final one that he gives to us, that God has given to us as believers. Not, are we, not only are we to restore the saints, we are to rescue the sinner. That's the greatest ministry God has ever given to his people. The ministry of winning souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought the more that I, I studied the Bible, the more I'm convinced. The bottom line is we are to be constantly telling people about the Lord. Amen. That is the ministry of soul winning. The greatest thing that you and I could ever do is to lead a person to Jesus Christ. Amen. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. And when you look at these verses... In the book of James, it's in the light of a lost sinner, you'll see that there's a misery taking place in these verses. I want you to notice the misery of the lost sinner in these verses. Verse 20, it says, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner, it's talking about the lost person, from the error, there's that word error, error, of his ways, to, to wander aimlessly is what it's saying there. Except this is a lost person. Here's the picture. It's of a lost sinner, and they, like the Christian, they're wandering aimlessly. And I thought, what a picture 
of our day. What, what a picture of lost people right now in our world. There, there are people right outside this church, right across the street, right over, all over the place. They have no direction. They have no sense of meaning. They have no sense of purpose. There are multitudes of, of millions of people in our world who have no sense of direction. They don't know why they're here. They don't know what their purpose is in life. They don't even know what the meaning of life is. They're all out there all around us and James says let him know that he who converted the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death did you notice the three-step progression here of the lost person it talks about the error wondering then sinning and then he says then dying and when you apply this to lost people that this dying part it means eternal death yeah. it means eternal separation it means everlasting punishment in hell. I thought, do you really believe that when people die outside the Lord Jesus Christ, they go to an eternal hell? Do you believe that? Do you really believe that when someone dies without Christ, they go to hell forever? If we believe that, then we can't stay the same. If we believe that, how, how can we not tell people about Jesus Christ if we believe that people who die without him Go to a place of everlasting punishment. That, that's the misery in this verse. Wandering people aimlessly, just sinning all through life, dying without Christ, with no hope or promise of the future. That's the misery in this verse, but there's also a ministry in this verse. James continues, he says, He who converts the sinner from the error of his way shall save that soul from death. What an opportunity that it is to lead someone to Jesus Christ. I want you to think to yourself right now, when's the last time you told someone about Jesus? The last time you shared your faith, the last time you shared your testimony, the last time you just struck up a conversation and shared with them about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done in your heart. I encourage you, we need to get busy about it, amen? We need to get on fire about it. We, we are living in a time of apathy. I was talking to a friend the other day, and he said, we, we have become apathetic in our walk with the Lord. We just, we don't care. Uh, don't waste my time. My time is precious to me. And there are hosts of people dying, going into eternal damnation. But if you look, James says, you'll save a soul from death. And then he says this, and you'll cover a multitude of sins. There was a preacher named William Sangster. He was a, a great preacher of another uh, day. Uh, he was on his way to preach one evening, and uh, he was walking to the church, and there came this terrible thunderstorm. So he said, I, I just stepped in under this awning of a building on my way, and as I stood there waiting for the rain uh, to stop, he said, all of a sudden, some man came in and stopped under the same awning. He said, in the course of that man being there, he said, I believe God had sent the man for me to try to win him to Christ. Thank you. So he said, while I waited there, I witnessed to him for six and a half minutes, and I led that man to Jesus Christ. Amen. Six and a half minutes of my time. And then he asked the crowd that night as he preached to them, he said, I want to ask all of you a question. If you had been under that awning that night, would you have won that person to Jesus Christ? Bill Bright, the president of Campus Crusade for Christ years ago, said this. He said, millions of surveys which we have helped take around the world indicate that approximately 98% of Christians do not regularly introduce others to the Savior. 98%. George Sweeting tells of a man by the name of John Currier, who in 1949 was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Many years later, he was transferred and paroled to work on a farm in Tennessee. In 1968, Courier's sentence was terminated. And a letter bearing the good news was sent to him. However, that letter got lost. John never saw the letter, nor was he ever told anything about it. Life on that farm was hard and without promise for the future, yet, yet John kept doing what he was told, even after the farmer for whom he was to work for even died. Ten full years went by. Then a state parole officer learned about 
this man's situation and found him. And told him that his sentence had been terminated, that he was a free man. They said that man dropped to his knees and began to weep, thinking, I am now free from the bondage that I have been in. And, and Sweeting concluded his story by asking the crowd. He said, would it matter to you if someone sent you an important message, the most important message of your life, and year after year after year, the urgent message was never delivered? He said, we who have heard the good news... You and I who've experienced freedom through Jesus Christ, we are the ones responsible to proclaim it to others who are still enslaved in sin. Are we doing all we can to make sure that people get the message? I thought that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's what we need to get busy about. Look at that, my, my sermons are so powerful, I'm knocking the lights out. <laughs> Reset, <laughs> but it's, it, it's what we as a church need to be all about because I, I thought have you ever thought how easy it is to lose a sense of what's really important yeah, today yeah, yeah. I mean you get so just caught up in everything going on around us and we forget uh, what is really important and if we're not careful we, we can get involved in a lot of other things and we can get preoccupied with a lot of other things, a lot of activities, a, a lot of programs, a, a lot of all these other things. But if we're not careful, we will lose the sense of what really matters to Jesus Christ. And what really matters is that you and I faithfully tell sinners about Christ. So James closes out his letter to us by telling us our, our two main priorities as a believer. Verse 19, we're to restore the saint. Verse 20, we're to rescue the sinner. I'll close with this story while visiting her friend. It's a man by the name of, of Howard Doan. He lived in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, Fanny Crosby, who you know was the hymn writer, the blind hymn writer, uh, was asked to speak to a group of blue-collar workers. Near the end of her address, she had an overwhelming sense that some mother's boy before her, even though she couldn't see, some mother's boy before her must be rescued that night or he would never be rescued at all. So she mentioned this to the crowd pleading. If there is a dear boy here tonight who has perchance wandered away from his mother's home and his mother's teaching, would you please come to me at the close of the service? Afterward, there was a young man, 18 years old. He approached her and he said, did you mean me? He said, I promised my mom that I'd meet her in heaven. But he said, but the way I've been living, I just don't think it's possible now. Annie Crosby said, I had the joy of leading that young man to Jesus Christ. She said, returning to my room that night, all I could think about was the theme, rescue. And so she said, I went over and thought in my mind, yeah. and I, when I retired that night, she had written the complete hymn, Rescue the Perishing. So the next day, she gave it to the, her friend Howard Doan. He wrote the music, and it was published that following year. She said, would you believe, 35 years later, I was speaking at a, a YMCA in Massachusetts. She said, I recounted the story behind Rescue the Perishing about the boy that came up to me and the, the boy I led to, to Jesus Christ. She said, after the service, a man approached her and she said, I could tell his voice was quivering. He said, Miss Crosby, I was that boy who more than 35 years ago had wandered from my mother's God. He said, that evening you, you spoke and I sought and found peace and I've tried to live a consistent Christian life ever since. And he said, if we ever meet again or never meet again on this earth, I just want you to know, I'll meet you and my mother in heaven. He turned and left. And Fanny later described it as one of the most gratifying experiences of her life. That old song says this, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're here tonight, and I would say 
most if not all are, are believers and James has talked to us about a lot of things but he comes and he closes it up and closes his letter and closes his book to believers by telling us our job the number one job is twofold we're to restore the saint those who have wandered from God those who are out of the church we're to bring them back in Number two, we're to rescue the sinner. We're to witness and tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I ask you, when's the last time that you've shared your faith with someone? When's the last time you have led someone to the Lord? I wonder how many tonight would raise their hand and say, Will, I want you to pray for me that this week, this very week, God will send someone my way like William Sankster, who just showed up under an awning, and here came a man, that someone will come my way, and that I will have the boldness to speak the word of God. How can I keep it to myself to share the love of Jesus Christ with that person? I would say, I want to do that this week. I want to do that. I pray God will give us the boldness this week. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that, that you rescued us who were perishing. So God, help us not to keep it to ourselves. Help us to share it with others who are lost and away from you. We love you. We thank you. You know each and every heart. And I pray that you would give us the boldness, even this next week, the next time we meet, that, that we could say, you know what, I led somebody to the Lord, or I talked to somebody about their faith. Lord, whether they get saved or not, Lord, that's up to you. That's up to them. But help us to share the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to move and to work in their lives. We thank you for the opportunity to share this wonderful truth. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand together, if you need to pray for whatever reason, would you come? Page 153. I wander far away.